As you watch this teaching, I would like to ask you to please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it. My name is Rick Renner, and today I'm in Jerusalem standing in a chapel that is actually inside Golgotha Mountain. The word Golgotha means the place of a skull. Why was it called Golgotha, and what did it have to do with a skull? Well, according to very early Christian history, and even Jewish history, this was the place where Adam was buried. And Origen, the great Christian leader, as early as the second century, said Jesus was crucified just above the burial place of Adam, and if that is the case, it would have been here. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 27 that at the time of Jesus' crucifixion, there was a great earthquake. And in fact, if you look beyond the glass in this wall, you see the bedrock is split due to an earthquake. And early Christian writers said that when Christ died, his blood went down that crack, spilling from the cross, and spilled up on the skull of Adam. And symbolically, he represented Jesus' blood being shed for the sins of the human race. The second Adam covered everything that happened due to the first Adam. This is very well supported by early Christian history. In fact, if you look at Orthodox crosses and icons in the Orthodox Church, very often you'll see the crucifix. And at the base of the crucifix, there is a skull. That represents the skull of Adam. That is Golgotha. When Jesus died, he died for the sins of the whole human race. And that is what I'm going to talk to you about today. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. Welcome back to the program. Today I'm going to keep talking to you about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. But before we get into the teaching, I want to encourage you. This Sunday is Easter. And at the time of Easter, people naturally feel inclined to go to church. And if you have friends or associates or family members that are not saved, this is your golden opportunity to pick them up, to call them, to make sure they get to church where they can hear the gospel preached. This is your opportunity to help bring someone into the kingdom of God. What a joy it will be for you if you see your friend or your associate or a family member repent of sin and make Jesus the Lord of their life. Can you imagine anything better to happen this Easter? So work on that. Pray about who you can bring. And by the way, if you need someone to pray with you, call us. If you don't know who else can pray with you, we are here for you. We are people of prayer. We're very dedicated to prayer. And if you're praying for someone to be saved or a friend who needs to come to Christ, or if you're facing some need in your personal life and you don't know who else to talk to, contact us, our team, our prayer staff. We will really pray for you. But I want to remind you also that I'm offering you my series called Unknown Facts About the Death, Burial, and Resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's 25 parts based on these wonderful programs. And it comes with a study guide that's filled with all the Greek words, the definitions, the points, the principles, a lot of information about Roman law, Jewish customs, everything having to do with the story of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And the reason I call it unknown facts is because these were facts that were unknown to me. Maybe they're known to you, but I grew up in church and I think most people growing up in church heard the same thing that I heard year after year after year. And when I became an adult, I became hungry to know more of the story. So I began digging through the Gospels and found such amazing things. For example, I found in Mark chapter 14 that a dead boy was raised from the dead right in the garden of Gethsemane. No one had ever told me that, but I found that as I began studying the Gospels. And in this 25-part series, there are so many details, vivid details of events that no one told me. And I want to share them with you. And that's why I call this Unknown Facts about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're also offering you my book, which is called Paid in Full, an in-depth book at the defining moments of Christ's passion. I really cannot recommend this book highly enough. Yes, I wrote it, but I have to tell you, it's even a benefit to me. 
When you write as much as I write, you can't always remember everything you've written. And sometimes I go back to review and to prepare for these programs. I've been reviewing this book and I'm telling you, this book is a treasure. I really want you to have this book. It will take you somewhere new in your understanding and in your faith. It is just tremendous. The back of the book says, a revolutionary look at the story you thought you knew. It's about the defining moments of Christ's passion. And today I'm going to be reading to you from this book because I cannot improve on what I wrote in the pages of this book. But very quickly, we're going to go back to where we were in the last program. In the last program, we were looking at the act of crucifixion. And today I brought this replica of a Roman nail which would have been used to crucify a person during the first century at the very time when Jesus was crucified. It's a horrible thing. They would drive this through the wrist of an individual and then they would hoist the individual up and drop the beam into a groove on an upright post that formed the cross. And once that person was hoisted there and his body was simply dangling, then they would take his feet and would pull them up and they would begin to nail a similar nail through the bones of his feet into the back cross beam, the upright post, so the person crucified was crucified in his wrists and also in his ankles. It was just a horrific event. And the Bible tells us Jesus endured this for you and for me. If you didn't hear the last program, go to the archives, watch it, because it is loaded with information about what happened when a person was crucified. And we need to understand that because that is the price that Jesus paid for you and he paid for me. But today we're going to begin Matthew chapter 27, verse 26, and very quickly review. The Bible's talking about Pilate, and the Bible says, And when he, Pilate, scourged Jesus, we've already seen this word scourge from the Greek word phrygello. This word phrygello, I'm going to read to you from my notes, was one of the most horrific words used in the ancient world because of the terrible images that immediately came to mind when a person heard this word. It meant to flog, to scourge. It was just terrible what they did when they scourged an individual. And you have to remember that scourging was entirely in the hands of the Roman officials. And the Roman officials really delighted in the fact that they were the very best at scourging a victim. And when they scourged someone, they tore his skin from his body and ripped his body open. It was a horrible event. And the Bible says Pilate scourged Jesus. I think it's unfortunate that when we read this in the King James Version, people just skip right over this and they don't really understand what they're reading. When the Bible says he scourged him, they ripped his body open. It's a horrible word. And then when they were finished scourging Jesus, the verse goes on to say, then delivered him to be crucified. And we saw the word crucified is taken from the Greek word stauros. The word stauros describes an upright pointed stake that was used for the punishment of criminals. The fact that Jesus was crucified means he died the death of a criminal. It was used to describe those who were hung up, impaled, or beheaded, and then publicly displayed. This was always used in connection with public execution. It is so horrible that when Paul writes about it in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8, Paul says, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. In Greek, the word even is very important. It's the word day. And it would be better translated like this. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Then the Greek inserts the word day, even the death of the cross, which means even, if you can imagine it, he sunk so low, he went to such an extent that he even died the death of a cross. There was nothing more miserable in the ancient world than the death of the cross. In fact, Seneca, who was a famous teacher, said that suicide was preferable to crucifixion. That is how horrible was crucifixion. Now, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, the Bible tells us in John chapter 19, verse 30, just as he died, he cried out famous words. He cried out and he said, it is finished. And today that's our focus. What did those words mean when Jesus cried out on the cross and said, it is finished? And you're going to find out today there were four primary meanings conveyed in this phrase. But I want to begin by reading from page 204 in my book, Paid in Full. No death was more scandalous than the death on a cross. Such a death was dreadful and hideous. Blood, 
drenched down Jesus' torso, pouring from his head and his brow, running like rivers from the deeply torn flesh in his hands and his feet. The scourging that Jesus had received in Pilate's palace began to take its toll on his body as his body swelled up and became horribly discolored and disfigured. His eyes were matted with blood that poured from the wounds in his brow, wounds that were caused by the crown of thorns that bore down in his skull as the soldiers pushed it down hard upon his head. The whole scene was ugly, unsightly, repulsive, sickening, vile, foul, and revolting. It was just terrible what they put Jesus through. In the Jewish world, nakedness was a particularly profound shame. Because the body was made in the image of God, the Jewish people believed it was a great dishonor to display a naked body. So as if Jesus' suffering had not already been enough, he experienced the ultimate act of shame as he hung on the cross naked and exposed before all those who were watching. Approximately 700 years earlier, the prophet Isaiah prophesied Jesus' appearance on the cross. Listen to what Isaiah said in Isaiah 52, verse 14. He wrote, And as many as were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man in his form, more than the sons of men. In Isaiah 53, verse 2, Isaiah continued to say, He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire of him. Jesus was put through horrendous forms of torture and had been abused and battered. As a result, the Bible says, his face and his whole appearance was marred more than any man's and his form beyond that of the sons of men. The New International Version says it like this. His appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. That is how much Jesus had been put through. In Isaiah 53, verses 3 through 5, Isaiah continued to describe Jesus' sacrifice when he said, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. What Jesus looked like on the cross was so horrible, people couldn't even bear to look upon him. They hid their faces. They couldn't bring themselves to look on him. He had been so discolored, disfigured, so beaten, and people hid their faces. I don't know about you, but even if you watch a movie about the crucifixion, sometimes you wince, you close your eyes, you just can't look upon it. Every time you turn your eyes from looking upon the cross, you are fulfilling this scripture, hiding your faces from the act of Jesus' crucifixion. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. And listen to these wonderful words. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. But John 19.30 tells us that when he died, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head, and he gave up the spirit, or he gave up his human spirit. He died. Those words, it is finished, now that's our focus today, is a translation of the Greek word tetelestai, it is finished, which means to end, to bring to completion, to bring to a conclusion, to complete, to accomplish, to fulfill, or to finish. It is a form of the Greek word telos, and the word telos describes anything that has arrived at completion, maturity, or perfection. There were many nuances to this word, but four of them have significance for this defining moment of Christ's sacrifice. Four important meanings of this word tetelestai, which is translated, it is finished. Number one. First, this was Jesus' exclamation that he had finished the work the Father sent him to do. The work having been fully completed, Jesus bowed his head and then died. Back in those days, when a servant was sent on a mission and then later returned to his master, the servant would say to his master, Tetelestai. That's the very word that Jesus exclaimed on the cross, translated, it is finished. When the servant returned to his master after having finished an assignment, the servant would say to the master, Tetelestai, meaning, I've done exactly what you requested or the mission is now accomplished. 
When Jesus cried out and said, Tetelestai, it is finished. He was exclaiming to the entire universe that he had faithfully fulfilled the Father's will and the mission was now accomplished. No wonder Jesus shouted those words. This was the greatest victory in the history of the human race. He had been faithful to his assignment even in the face of challenges. But now the fight was over and Jesus could cry out to the Father, Tetelestai, it is finished, which means I've done exactly what you asked me to do or the mission is now accomplished. Meaning number two of the words Tetelestai translated, it is finished. Second, the word tetelestai was the equivalent of the Hebrew word spoken by the high priest when he presented a sacrificial lamb without spot or blemish. Every year, the high priest entered the Holy of Holies where he poured the blood of that sacrificial spotless lamb on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. The moment that blood touched the mercy seat, atonement was made for the people's sins for one more year. When once again, the high priest would enter beyond the veil of that sacred room to offer blood, this was done year after year to obtain the annual temporary forgiveness of sin. But when Jesus hung on the cross, he was both lamb and high priest. In that moment, our great high priest, Jesus, offered up his own blood as the permanent removal of sin. He offered up the perfect sacrifice of which every sacrifice was a type and a symbol. And in that instant, there remained no more need for an offering for sin. Jesus was the final sacrifice. Jesus entered into the holy place and offered up his own blood, a sacrifice so complete that God never again required the blood of lambs for forgiveness. Thus, when Jesus cried out to Telestai, translated, it is finished, he was declaring the end of sacrifice because the ultimate sacrifice had finally been made. Atonement was completed, perfected, and fully accomplished. It was done once and for all, finished forever. Number three, the meaning of tetelestai, the words, it is finished. Number three, in a secular sense, the word tetelestai, translated, it is finished, was used in the business world to signify the full payment of a debt. Now listen. When a debt had been fully paid off, the parchment on which the debt was recorded was stamped with the words, Tetelestai, it is finished, which means the debt had been paid in full. This means that once a person calls Jesus the Lord of his life and personally accepts his sacrifice, no debt of sin exists for that person any longer. The debt is wiped out because Jesus paid the price for sin that no sinner could ever pay. Can you say amen to that? Tetelestai, it is finished. Jesus stamped on your debt, paid in full because he shed his own blood on the cross. Jesus took our pace. He paid the debt of sin we owed. And when we by faith repent and receive him as Lord, we are set free. So when Jesus uttered those words, it is finished. It was the equivalent of his declaration that the debt was fully satisfied, fulfilled, and complete. His blood utterly and completely cleansed us forever. It was far-reaching and all-embracive for all of us who put our faith in him. To tell us that it is finished. Then we come to meaning number four. Fourth, this word to tell us that, which is translated, it is finished, depicted a turning point when one period ended and another new period began. So it was the end of a period and the beginning of a new period. To tell us that it is finished, something is ending, and now something new is beginning. When Jesus exclaimed, it is finished, it was a turning point in the entire history of mankind. At that exact moment, the Old Testament came to an end, finished, and closed, and the New Testament immediately began. The cross was the great divide in human history, and when Jesus cried out and said, it is finished, he was shouting that the old covenant had ended and the new covenant had begun. To tell us that it is finished. In that moment when Jesus cried, it is finished, all the Old Testament prophecies about Jesus' ministry were fulfilled. The justice of God had been fully met and satisfied by the Lamb of God. 
And at that moment, the sacrifices of the Old Testament permanently ceased because the perfect sacrifice had laid down his life for the salvation of mankind. Jesus' mission was complete. Thus, he could cry out that it was complete. Never forget that because Jesus was willing to offer his own blood for the full payment of our sinful debt, we are forgiven and utterly debt-free. Paid in full has been stamped on our past sinful record because Jesus paid the price for our redemption with his own blood. So when Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 53 verses 4 and 5, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our sin was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. It means if you are consumed with grief, Jesus bore your grief. If you're overwhelmed with sorrow, he carried your sorrows. If you're trapped in a life of transgression, he was wounded for your transgressions. If you're living in sin, you can be forgiven because he was bruised for our iniquities. If you're tormented and have no peace, he was chastised for our peace. And if you're physically or mentally sick, he was wounded for our healing. All of that is what Jesus purchased by his sacrifice on the cross. Jesus paid the price for salvation, for liberation, and for physical healing and your complete and total restoration. When the price for your forgiveness was complete, Jesus then bowed his head and died. God's justice had been fulfilled. The old covenant had come to an end and the new covenant had begun. It was the fulfillment of one and the beginning of another. All of that in these words, it is finished, the Greek word, to tell us died. Wow, when Jesus cried those words, no wonder he cried them out so loudly. It was a shout of victory. Everything you sent me to do, Father, I have done it. The mission is now complete. It is finished. Wow. Christ paid the price for your freedom, for your healing, for your deliverance, for your peace. All of it belongs to you because Jesus paid the price with his own blood on the cross. And as we prepare for Easter, it's good that we stop and think about the price that Jesus paid and that by faith we embrace everything he purchased for us. He didn't do all of that so we would be miserable in life. He did all of that so we would experience the results of freedom. Wow. We're out of time, but I'll be back in just a moment and I'm going to pray for you. From the courtyard of Pilate to the hill of Calvary, Every step Jesus took on that Good Friday, he had you in mind. The Bible says Jesus died so our debt could be paid in full. In his book, Paid in Full, Rick Renner guides you through the details of Jesus' final hours on earth. In Paid in Full, you'll discover that this striking narrative of love and redemption is much more than the story taught in Sunday school. This powerful book can be yours for just $15. When you call or go online today, you can also get unknown facts about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Available in digital or physical formats, starting at just $40, you can discover the power of the cross and the plan to forgive mankind of sin like never before. Don't miss this special offer, paid in full, and unknown facts about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Call now or go to renner.org. My name is Joe Renner coming to you from Moscow, Russia. And I want to tell you how your support is impacting thousands of people right here in Moscow. All around the world, people are living longer and many elderly people in Moscow are left helpless and lonely. Loneliness is a terrible thing. No one should be left to die in loneliness. But because of your financial support, we're able to reach these wonderful people. Each week, we hold a concert for this great generation. After the concert, we invite these people to stay for a Bible study where they hear about Christ. Through these events, thousands of people have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior in the sunset years of their lives. 
Now, not only are they finding community, overcoming their loneliness, but they're finding hope. They're finding Jesus. Would you consider joining us as a partner today? With your support, we're able to reach even more of these precious people. No one should die lonely. More importantly, no one should die without the opportunity to know Jesus. With your support, we're able to reach these people. Right from your home, you can help us help others by becoming a partner and a part of the solution. Please call us or go online to renter.org. Your generous support makes a difference. Please call or go online right now. Today we've been talking about Jesus crying out those words, it is finished. They had driven a nail like this through Jesus' wrists, through his feet. They crucified him to an upright post. The act of crucifixion was just horrible. But the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 12, these important words. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. In that moment on the cross, that cross became the holy of holies. And Jesus, who is our great high priest, was also the Lamb of God. The great high priest entered into that holy of holies where the cross was, and he didn't offer the blood of calves and natural lambs, but as the Lamb of God, he offered up his own blood to satisfy the justice of God. Jesus paid the price on the cross, which became the holy of holies in that moment, where our forgiveness was permanently purchased by his act of redemption. That is just remarkable. Wow. Now, when we come back tomorrow, we're going to see what happened after this. Jesus was buried, and you're going to see that his death was no hoax. Jesus really died. They proved it over and over again. Don't miss tomorrow's program. But I want to remind you that I'm offering you my series called Unknown Facts about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Order this. It's really tremendous. And my book called Paid in Full, an in-depth look at the defining moments of Christ's passion. But I want to pray for you. Father, I pray right now for every friend listening to me. And I pray that this week we will take advantage of this opportunity to bring people to a saving knowledge of Jesus. Empower us to boldly invite people to church where they can hear the good news of the gospel. In Jesus' name. Well, we're out of time, but remember Ecclesiastes 8.4. It says, where the word of a king is, there's power. God's word has so much power. So let that power work in your life today. And I'll see you in the next program. Rick Renner Ministries is proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ through every available media to the uttermost parts of the earth. Discover the many ways you can help us make a difference in lives around the world with the word of God. We invite you to partner with us in teaching, strengthening, and rescuing lives for the glory of God. Together, we can make a difference that will last throughout eternity. If that teaching helped you, would you please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it.